All right, let's, uh, let's get started. So before we, again, before we talk about today's content, let's do, quick, do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. So we basically go over the virtual memory bootstrap process. So here is what the physical memory looks like in different stages in the bootstrap process. So it, at the very beginning, before even kernel gets running, this exception handler is loaded into memory, occupies some physical physical memory, and then kernel is loaded right after that. After that, so after after RAM bootstrap, we kind of know um, how much memory do we have, and what's the end of the kernel, which is the start of the available physical address. Then, at this point. Uh, um, you can call RAM still memory to keep allocating some memory before you have a functional call map. And when you reach uh, VM bootstrap, this is what the physical memory looks like. Part of the physical memory has been already occupied, and you know the first available physical address by uh, looking at the first physical address uh, variable in RAM.c. And inside RAM, RAM boost, uh, VM bootstrap, you are supposed to initialize the call map um, at, this, at this, and uh, after VM bootstrap, or can malloc requests should go to allocated key pages, which should call your code to allocated pages. So before VM get, VM get bootstrapped, uh, allocated key pages can just call a uh, RAM still memory. It's okay. And after VM bootstrapped, you should uh, consult your call map to do the physical page allocation instead of just a call RAM still memory. Right? So this is the a view of the physical memory during the bootstrap process. And you can, you can sort of imagine what it, what it is like after the system is running for a while. So this part is, will be still there. Kernel will be still there. Stolen, there is no way to uh, free the stolen pages. So call map will be still there. So inside this uh, blank free memory chunk, some of the pages will be occupied, some of them will be available. And that status is reflected in your call map data structure. So during the whole lifetime of the kernel, this part is kind of fixed, even including the call map, because the call map size doesn't change, right? So what, what's changing is the status of the pages after this region, or the available regions, when, after VM gets bootstrapped. So this is the view of the physical memory. And we also looked in detail what the call map looks like. So basically, call map is the array of entries, right? Each entry corresponding to one physical page. And that entry, entry contains some many information about that page, whether the page is available, what's the page status, what's the page's owner, and so on, right? So, um, you can get, uh, figure out how many call map entries you need by uh, calculating how many physical pages do you have in total. Say you have 1,000 physical pages, then the length of the call map will be 1,000. Then inside each call map entry, you need to decide what information you want to keep for the call map for each page. Right? We already mentioned that you want to keep whether the page is available or not, and you want also want to know. Uh, when you call allocated key pages, how many pages exactly was allocated? So later on, when you call free key pages, you can free exactly that many uh, physical pages. And you also need the owner information. Um, for, uh, so later on, when you do swapping, you can notify the owner. We will talk about that um, in next recitation. So for now, you can keep your call map uh, uh, minimal. Uh, I mean, you can only keep the page state and chunk size. You, didn't, you don't need to worry about the owner for now. And later on, when you do need to recall the owner information, you can just add more fields to the call map entry. I assume it's a C structure, so it's, it's very easy to um, add fields into it. So this is the, what the call map looks like. And uh, at the end of last presentation, we also look at how MIPS translate different uh, virtual addresses depending on which region that virtual address falls into, right? So if it's a user address, which is defined by below, ox, and medium, 
the hardware will consult the TLB to figure out the correct physical address. And it's the kernel's responsibility to uh, manage the TLB to fill, to fill in correct values into the TLB so the hardware can do the correct translations. Um, if the virtual address is in that kernel segment zero region, then the hardware will know that, okay, this address is a kernel address, right? I will not use the TLB. Instead, I will do the direct translation by subtracting that virtual address by OX and median, which is effectively equivalent to just ignore the most significant bit of the virtual address and use that to, as the physical address. And you can see that since that region, that virtual address region is, the size of it is 512 megabytes fixed. Right? No matter how much physical memory you have, that virtual memory region is, the size of it is fixed. So you can imagine that some portion of the virtual addresses cannot be mapped to a uh, physical address. Not all of them are being mapped to physical address. For example, you only have four megabytes of physical memory. That's what you have, all you have. And uh, you access some virtual memory that above this four megabytes region, say somewhere here at the top of the region, then the hardware don't really know how to handle it. You get, get some uh, bus error and something like that. That's because you don't have enough uh, physical memory. And uh, similarly, for kernel segment one, we have the similar mapping, just that the hardware will adopt a different caching policy. So in this assignment, you don't need to care about the kernel segment one. You don't need to uh, worry about that. And uh, similarly, for kernel segment two, it's not used in this assignment. Uh, you don't, you don't um, need to use that either. So what uh, you guys will be dealing most in this assignment is the virtual addresses in user segment, which is belong to user program, and also in current segment, which is the kernel's own uh, memory. And if you uh, kind of know this figure, you, you will have some, some idea of the questions like, uh, why the kernel physical pa kernel virtual pages have to be continuous, right? That's the one requirement in allocated cache pages. You cannot just give in n arbitrary pages. That n pages has to be continuous, both uh, virtually and physically. That's because of the, we don't have that TLB mapping capability in kernel uh, for kernel addresses. And you also know that why when you find some victim to swap out when you don't have physical memories you cannot choose the kernel pages because we don't have that TLB in the middle to help us uh, capture whether that page is swapped out or not. So once you allocate the physical page, it stays in memory. It will never be swapped out. So that's basically what we talked about last time. Any questions before we go on? Okay. Um, so today we're gonna talk about the user address space. So last time we basically covered the physical page man management, the call map stuff. This time we'll uh, talk about the user address space, including uh, how to design the page table, what's the user address space looks like, and how to handle the TLB and virtual memory fault. So first, page table. As you already know, page table is a mapping between the physical, between the virtual and physical addresses. Right? The functionalities of the page table is quite simple. So given a virtual address, find me uh, a physical address associated with that uh, virtual address. Right? So you will, you will uh, realize that in earlier exi uh, assignments, you have some other uh, similar data structures like <coughs> file table, which is a mapping between the file descriptor and the file handle. Right? You have uh, a mapping. And also process table is a mapping between the process ID, which is integer, to the process structure. So you have all kinds of these mappings. And for, um, for a map, you would easily imagine what's the requirement or what's the interface, interface of the map. So um, the functionality of the page table is nothing but what a normal map should provide. So given a virtual address and a given operation, you get this two information in the VM Ford handler. So say user want to access this virtual address either to write it or read uh, from it. So the page table should be able to tell me that, 
first of all, whether this operation is valid. So say user wanted to write to a uh, virtual memory. Can the user actually write to it? If the page is read-only, then you cannot really write to it. Right? So the page table should tell me that information. And the second information, which is uh, more um, important information, is that if the operation is valid, which is most of the cases, then give, get me the physical address associated with that virtual address. So this is the requirement of the page table. You want to keep this in mind when you design your actual page table structures. And how many of you have already have some page table structure written? How many of you have uh, done with the CAM1 and CAM2 test? That's good. Half of them. Yeah. Other, others may want to catch up because you are really supposed to get that part done already. And uh, so we'll talk about uh, uh, several design alternatives of the patch table. And first, the first one, which is the simplest one, will be the link list. And um, so a natural way to implement a map is that internally you have a list of all the map entries. Right? So every time you are being asked that given a virtual address, tell me some information, you just traverse that list or array, and then you uh, return the corresponding list. It's a list, not an array, because um, different users may have different memory foot footprint. Right? Some, of, some user programs may occupy a lot of memory, in which case you need a lot of entries, while others, like being true, being false, only occupy one or two pages. So the, the size is variable. That's why you cannot use a fixed size array to, um, uh, to handle the, to, to use it in the page table. And so if you use, uh, adopt this design option, then you, it's quite uh, intuitive that each link list node is an entry in the page table. Then you link all those nodes up. This, is, this will be your page table, right? And uh, so you store some information inside the list node about the mapping, what's the, what's the virtual address, what's the physical address, and some other information. And whenever you uh, want to query this list, you have to traverse the whole list. In the worst case, you have tra to traverse the whole list before you can find a hit. Right? So let's first talk about what information you want to store in each list node. Then we move on to what's the operation to do on the page table. So first of all, because it's the mapping, you have a key, which is the virtual address. Right? Uh, note that this virtual address is not some arbitrary virtual address. It's the virtual page's base address, which is always 4K aligned. Right? For, a for a virtual page, you always want to use some aligned address as the key to represent that virtual, a virtual page. Right? In this case, we're using the base address of the virtual page. So this virtual address could, could only be the multiples of 4K, right? 4K, 8K, 16K, and so on. So this, the virtual address, we have it as the key. And other parts is sort of the value of this entry. Right? We have the physical address, which is corresponding to the physical address of the actual physical page. Again, this physical page is, physical address is also page aligned. Right? For each page, you want to use some aligned address as the page's uh, address. Then you may want to store other information also, because for a given virtual address and operation, you want to tell whether or not this operation is valid, first of all, uh, before you move on, you uh, continue to try to get the physical address. Right? So here you want to st store some permission information. Right? Is this page readable? Is this page writable? Is it executable? And so on. And also, you may also want to store some state information. For example, the, the, this virtual page could be swapped out Right, you want to record that information somewhere, so when you have a page fault on that virtual page, you know where to find the um, the virtual page on the disk. Right, so this is the sort of information you want to store in your page tab entry. And finally, of course, this is because this is a link list, and we have a pointer to the next entry of the um, uh, next entry of the page table. 
so this is the um, what one node of the patch table looks like. Any questions of this? I see several people use this kind of design. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just uh, uh, it's simple, and you may be familiar with the linked list in the data structure course, so it's okay to use it. And uh, of course, there are pros and cons of this approach. What's the advantage of this approach? What's that? Yeah, so you can imagine that most of the user, addre user virtual address will be sparse in the sense that in, the, in, the, in all the two gigabyte uh, virtual pages, only a small, a tiny portion of the pages are actually being mapped to physical pages, right? So if you use a linked list, you are very flexible on how many pages you need. You can allocate as many as uh, page table entries on demand, which save some space, right? So the, the, the page table size depends on how large the user program is. Right? If the user program is really lightweight, like Bing 2 and Bing 4, you end up really you end up using much less page table entries. That's one advantage of this approach. And another advantage, of course, is, is simple. It's, uh, you can, it's something you can understand and, and digest. And the, 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 cons, the, the disadvantage of this approach is also obvious. It's the wrong time, right, efficiency. So every time um, you want to query some virtual address, the worst case scenario, you have to traverse up all the linked list the complexity will be big O n, right? That's the, the price you pay. But for this assignment, uh, efficiency or performance is really not the concern here. You can re so it's okay to use this kind of linked list. And in terms of space, space efficiency, actually um, suppose that most of the virtual pages will be used. Then what's, uh, when, then what's the efficiency of this uh, in terms of space. So how large is one table entry, way page table entry? So first of all, you have a pointer, which is fixed, four bytes. Right? You have virtual address, physical address, again, four bytes each. You have 12 bytes already. Then you have some other information like permission state, and if you do a really good job, you can compress it to another four bytes. So it's 16 bytes per entry. Right? Imagine you have a bunch of this. And it's, it's more of a VS when you compare to the next design alternative, which is the actual page table. So for each entry, you need 16 bytes, whereas in, in the later design uh, alternative, you only need four. So speaking of effic space efficiency, or uh, it's really a two-side thing, right? So on one hand, you can allocate as, you can be very flexible about how many page table entries you need. On the other hand, you do end up using more memory or using more uh, bytes for each page table entry. So the second design alternative is the classic two-level page table that you learned from the class, right? Because um, the virtual address is fixed, it's 32 bytes, and we can split the, uh, by the bits in the address into different regions, and we use them to index different tables. So for example, a possible design could be like this. I use the first 10 bit. This is the lowest uh, significant bit. This is the highest significant bit. I use the, the higher 10 bit as an index to a first level page table, right? Um, because I have 10 bit, how many uh, page table entries do I need to allocate here? Uh, two to the power of 10 which is 1K, 1K entries here, right? So um, the first 10 bit, uh, you can use the first 10 bit to identify the entry in the first level page table. Of course, you have some fixed pointer in your address, address space structure to identify the, the best address of the page table, right? Given the best uh, uh, table, page table base, given the index, you can think of the 10 bit as index is an integer. You can find the, pay, uh, the entry in the first level page table. Given this entry, this entry are supposed to point to the base of the second level page table, right? 
So then you can use the middle 10 bit as an index again to index this array to find out the, um, the entry. The error should point to here. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it should point to this entry. So finally, you locate this entry. And this entry contains the best physical address of the page, right? So this is one page. And then you can use the last 12 bit as an index into this, uh, as offset into this pair, physical page to figure out what's the actual byte, right? So as um, the kernel, you only need to worry about the first two steps, which is locate the entry in the first level page table and the entry in the second level page table. Then you can just, uh, then you are pretty much done. You, you got the best uh, address of the page and you just uh, um, fix up the TLB entry and you'll be done with it. You don't need to worry about the 12 bit offset. So this is the classic um, two level page table design. Um, it's sort of complicated at first glance, but it's what's being really used in reality. And if you're working on x86 architecture, you will notice that this kind of structure is actually enforced by the hardware. So in terms of advantage, and disadvantages of this approach. So we, you can compare with the linked list approach. The advantage is what? Constant lookup time, right? No matter um, what, which kind of virtual address you want to look up, I always spend constant time, which is one query, two query. Then I got the physical address, right? So you always spend a constant time looking up the page table. And of course, the disadvantage is that uh, you may don't know really how to do it. And it's, it's kind of complicated. And also, for each page table entry, what's the, um, how many bytes you use for each page table entry? It's 20 and the other 12 No, that's not true. 32 bytes? No, 32 bits. Oh, you mean one entry? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's the case. So you basically pay four bytes for each page table entry, right? So you, initially you may think that for each virtual address, I need to carry two four bytes entries to get it. It's, it's, it may struck you as, oh, I need eight bytes for each entry. But that's not true because this four bytes is shared among all the page table entries in the second level. So the, the space cost of the first table uh, entry is actually amortized in the second level, which is kind of negligible because you are using four bytes for 1,000 <coughs> entries. Four divided by 1,000 is zero. So if you basically pay four bytes for each page table entry. Right? And also, you don't have to allocate this whole chunk for every entries, right? You can allocate this. You can allocate the second level page table on demand only when you need to access it. So, any questions on this um, page table design, the 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 linked list approach, the two level page table approach? Which one do you like? So the f there, there is only one first level page table. That page table contains 1,000 entries, 1,024 actually, right? And initially that's what you all, that all you need. You don't need to allocate any second level page tables at that point. And when user program gets running and have page table, when you query this first level, you find that this is points to nothing. That's the, that's the time you allocate the second page table, second level page table for that entry, right? So you don't, have, you don't have to allocate the second level page tables at all at, at first, unless you need to. So in, in, in times of page fault, when you pay for page fault, first you have the fault address, right? And you can get the first 10 bit of the fault address Carry this table because this table is always there. Get this entry and see if this entry is 
see the value of this entry points to some other pair tables. If it's now means that it doesn't point to anything, then you allocate a second level pair table and set up the link so that it, it points to the second level. Then you uh, query the second level and initialize this pair table entry, right? In other cases, so later on, say, suppose you have another um, page fault which has the identical first attempt bit, then you don't have to allocate another page, second level page tables. You can just use this one. Right? Yeah. So which one do you want to use? Two levels? You like challenges? It's no, uh, there is no right or wrong to use either approach. Uh, you can choose whichever one you want. This one is more classical and it's, it's more practical in the sense that it's actually being used. The previous one, no real system will use that, but it's okay to use it in these kind of toy expert uh, assignments. So any questions about the page table design? Okay, good. So let's move on to the um, user address space. So you, you, at this point, you all kind of get familiar with what the user virtual address looks like. Right? Somewhere in here we have a code segment and which contains the code of the user program. And we have a data segment for the user, which is the statically allocated variables. And we have a heap, which grows upward and at the top of the user address space, uh, we have a stack which grows downwards. So this is what the uh, user address space look like. And uh, in the address space structure, you kind of know what information you want to keep. Right? For example, you want to know uh, what are those regions. Right? Where does the region start? How large is the region? That's the information you want to keep. And remember how uh, dump VM keep that information. So dump VM make two assumptions. First, the user all, always have two regions, code and data. Second, the region size is fixed. Right? The second is kind of also true in this uh, case, in this assignment, but the first is definitely not true. Some of the user program will have more than two segments. Right? So you can assume that you don't know how many segments you need. In that case, what's the more uh, appropriate way to uh, maintain all those region information when you don't know how many entries you need? If you know, then you can use the array or, yeah. If you don't know, then you use a linked list. That's basically how you do it, right? So you can use a linked list of all the region informations to keep where the region, uh, where is the region start address, how large is the region. So inside um, the address space structure, you may have a small link list uh, to keep the region information. And then heap and stack is sort of a special region in the sense that their size can change, right? For code and data region, their size is really fixed when you load them into memory. But for heap and stack, their size change, right? So those are two special regions where you want to deal with, deal with them uh, separately. And of, of course, you also want a page table pointer. Either is, uh, if you use a linked list, it can point to the first node of the linked list, page table links. If you use a two-level page table, you, ha you should have some information of where the base address of the first level page table is, that page table base variable. You might want to, if, you, if you want to use this design, then you will want to store this address somewhere in the address space structure. So this is how, uh, what you should keep in the address space structure. And, uh, okay, so there are a couple of, so whenever you have design a structure, you, you always need to consider when, how to initialize the variables inside the structure, right? So there are a couple of questions here. So first, um, where the heap so be, even before that, 
how do you know where the code and data region is? So you have a small link list, initially it's empty. When you do AS create, so you create an empty link list in the address space. Then um, when your user program gets running, you should already have some information, have some knowledge of all the regions. In the middle, what happened? How do you initialize that link list of all the region information? Any ideas? So how do you know where the region start and how large the region is? I know, but how do you get that information? No, how do you initialize the pointers? So how, do you, so how do you know the address of this? How do you know the address of this? Or how do you know the length of this? Yeah. From the ELF file? From the ELF file, but that's not part of the address space, right? That's kind of lotelf.c that in there. You remember that last time when we talked about the, the interface of the address space, we mentioned the one interface called AS define region. This is how the other part of the system, which is a lot elf, tells you as a virtual address, uh, virtual memory system, or about the region information, where the region start and how large it is. And also, one uh, extra piece of information is what's the permission of that region, right? So for example, in SD5 region, uh, the lot elf will tell you that here is one region. It starts from here. The size is how many bytes? And the permission is executable, read-only, but not writable. This is the information you get from AS define region, right? So you can think of as a layer where the, there are some entries in the layer is the uh, is the interface call to the uh, virtual memory system. Below that, when you receive the AS define region call, you are supposed to remember that information, right? That's how you figure out how many regions are there in the user address space. So after that, you have a code region, a data region, and all that. So now the, the next question is, where the heap starts? So the AS define region will only tell you that there is this region, this region, fixed size, that we can know from the ELF file. But we don't know where the heap starts. That's another question you need to answer. You need to figure out. But um, uh, um, an intuitive thing of the heap is that it sh should, because it grows downwards, so we don't want the heap, for example, start from here. Because if it starts from here, then soon after we will hit the cool region, right? We are kind of limited by this. So you want the heap region to be the last region that there is no region after this heap region, right? So you kind of get some idea of to decide where the heap start. It should after all these regions. Again, you have this information um, by um, traversing all the regions and find the one with the la which is the last one, and you set the heap start to be right after that. This is how you initialize the heap region. Right? And the second question is that, um, so there is the trick thing about this code segment. So Lord Elf will tell you as a virtual memory system that now I'm going to define region. It's, it's uh, executable, it's readable, but not writable. Right? Then, OK, you remember this information. You keep that in the small link list of region information. Then the Lord Elf will actually try to write to that region, because that's how the Lord Elf, Lord Elf works. It read from the disk. Loading to memory. By loading, it means write. So if you do, don't do anything special in the VM fault, you will really get confused. Because, OK, when you, uh, so you, you will get a VM fault, say, on this virtual address. And you will get, OK, somebody is trying to write to this address. But according to the region information, the, all the virtual addresses inside this region are not writable. It's only readable. Should you reject it? Normally, you should, right? You should enforce this kind of permission. And if somebody wants to write to a read-only page, you should re reject that. But this case is different, though, because 
This is the first time somebody ever tried to write to that region. Actually, it's a lot of elf try to write to the region. You should allow that. So there are two cases here when you receive a write request to a read-only page. Right? If it's a lot elf, you should accept it. Because otherwise lot elf cannot do it, does cannot do his job. If it's not a lot elf, then you should reject it. So you, you sort of have a dilemma here of have a hard time to determine how you want to react to the write request to a read-only page. Right? And these two function calls are the key to the solution. So LoadF is kind of polite in the sense that before LoadF tried to write to a read-only region, say for example this one, it will call a function which is a kernel function, no user can call it, called as prepare load, which basically tells the virtual memory system that I'm going to load some content into memory, and in the process, I might need to write to some write-only page. Right? So you can imagine what you can do in the prepare load. You, in, inside AS prepare load, you can sniff, scan all the regions. If the region is, all, is not writable, you state it as writable. But you also make a backup of the original uh, permission information. Right? So in van fault, you don't have that confusion here. If it, it says writable, then it, it can write. You, you, even though the original permission may, be, uh, may not be writable. Right, so in AS prepare load, it allows you to do some bookkeeping to um, be able to write to that code region. Then after load elf is done, it will call another function called AS complete load, which tells you that I'm done with the loading. Now you can close the back door. From now on, uh, all the requests should be enforced, meaning that if somebody else wants to write to this code region, you should reject it. Right, so you can imagine that AS AS prepare load is kind of opening a backdoor so that load elf can write to it. And AS complete load is kind of a, you close the backdoor. Don't allow any um, unauthorized uh, operation on the pages. This part let me maybe a lot for you to digest at this point if you haven't worked on it yet, but you will soon realize that the usefulness of these two functions. At first, you may think that this function is no use, right? DumbVM doesn't, doesn't use it. That's because DumbVM um, don't do this kind of smart thing of on-demand page allocation stuff. And once you, once you have this, you have to think of all the cases where the memory can be accessed. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, so finally, we have context switches, which is, so during context switch, AS activate will be called, and inside AS, AS activate, what are you supposed to do? So how do you activate an address space? That's what they do, but why? Uh, yeah, so TLB is one CPU only have one TL, or one set of TLB, right? When you have different uh, uh, processes running on that same CPU, if you don't flush the TLB entries, when you uh, do context switch, the newer process will get confused about the virtual addresses because that virtual address mapping is not really my mapping. Right? So every time you have a context switch, you should try to shoot down all the TLB entries to make sure that the newly scheduled process or thread has a clean slate, has a clean TLB, uh, TLB buffer. Right? And again, it's, that's okay to do in this assignment because efficiency or performance is not a concern here. And if you really think about it, it's, it's really dumb. Right? You should be able to differentiate TLB entries that belong to different processes. That's kind of an advanced feature of this, but in this experiment, what you do really in AS Activate is just shoot down all the TLB entries. It's the, it's the brute force way to do it, but it, it works. Okay, um, 
So finally, TLB. We have been talking about TLB all the time, but let's take a really closer look of what the TLB really is. So TLB, as you already know, is a hardware cache for a virtual uh, physical mapping. Again, it's a mapping. Uh, it's a mapping from virtual page to physical page, but it's implemented in hardware. So th this is one TLB entry looks like, and we have in total 64 entries per CPU core. And each entry is 64 bits each, which can be divided into high and low. So the upper 32-bit is higher 32-bit, and lower is uh, lower 32-bit. So in the higher 32-bit, the higher 20-bit stores the virtual page number, which is, you can, so all these values will be zero. So you can view the entire higher 32-bit as a virtual address. So because this is all, always zero, this is 12 bits, this virtual address is always page aligned, right? So the higher 32-bit is the aligned virtual page address. Now, in the, in the lower 32-bit, we have different uh, bit here. So in the higher 32-bit, again, we have the physical page number, which is the aligned physical address divided by 4K. You can see that as we, this way. If you mask all this as zero, then the lower 32-bit will be the physical address, right? Because the, all the addresses here are all 4K aligned. So the lower 12-bit doesn't really get any use here. But the TLBs have some special flags here in this region because this is not already always used. And some of the flags are as this. They have a no cache flag, they have a dirty flag, and they have a valid flag. So for no cache, you don't need really to care about the cache stuff. And what's important is these two flags. So if when this flag is one or so the dirty flag is not what the name suggests. It actually means that whether or not this virtual address is writable. It's not a, a, a flag indicating whether this page is dirty or not. It's actually a flag that de decide whether this page can be written or not. So say if this third bit is zero, then uh, if any user want to write to that virtual page, when the hardware consults the TLB, okay, given a virtual address, I locate this TLB entry and I check the dirty bit. If the dirty bit is zero and the operation is a write, and the hardware will raise the TLB fault. That's, that's one kind of TLB fault, right? Then if this bit is zero and the operation is read, then every, everything is fine. I locate the TLB entry, is the user want to read from it, and it definitely can read from the TLB entry. Or let me put this way. So uh, when you have, when, whenever user want to access the virtual memory, access memory. As a hardware, what you get is two information. One information is what's the virtual address that user wants to access. The second information is what's the operation the user want to do. Is it read, write, or ex ex execute, right? You have these two information, and then you query your TLB buffer, right? Suppose you got a hit that you use the virtual page, uh, virtual um, uh, address as a key to query the TLB, then you get this entry. Then you check this bit, right? You have different combinations of the operation and this bit, right? One combination of them is that the operation is right and the bit is zero, in which case you should reject as a hardware. You don't, need, you don't implement this in, in the kernel. This is all done by the hardware. But, <coughs> but it's the kernel's responsibility to set this so if a page is writable, as in the heap and data segment, you should set this flag to be one to indicate that user can actually write to this page. Otherwise, you will keep get, getting TLB fault because the user are supposed to be able to write to the page. Now you are not giving the user the access to it. Okay, so this is what the dirty bit does. And also there's another bit called valid, which is kind of simple. If it's zero, then it's a valid entry. If it's not zero, then it's not valid, right? This one is quite simple. This one is a little bit, a little bit tricky. 
and there are some macros, uh, I think there are functions to help you to deal with TLB. You have functions like TLB probe, which is kind of read the content of the TLB. You have TLB read, TLB write, and TLB random. You can see the comments in the file to see what each function does. But it, as the core of it, you need to understand what the TLB looks like and what each bit, uh, what's the functionality of each bit. So as I just explained, you will get three types of TLB fault, uh, which is fault read, meaning that there is no such entry and user want to read, from, read uh, from the address. Fault write, meaning that there is still no such TLB entry, but the user want to write to it. And there is a third type of fault, which is just what we have described in the corner case, where the user want to write to a virtual page. There is already a mapping there, just that the 30 bit in that mapping is zero. So it's a special TLB fault called TLB fault read only. Right? So in VM fault, you get what's the fault address, what's the fault type. This is two information you get in your uh, VM fault handler. Then you need given different combinations of the uh, fault type and address, you need to handle the TLB fault. So finally, let's take a, took a look at how to deal with the virtual um, faults. So when you reach a VM fault, that's one function you wrote. This is probably the most compli complicated function in this whole assignment. What do you know? So depending on the fault type, if it's a fault read or fault write, you know that, okay, there is no TLB entry for this mapping. Right? If it's VM fault read only, then you know that you know more information. You know that there is already a TLB entry for that, just the 30 bit is zero, but the user wants to write to it. Right? So this is the information you get. And uh, so when you, whenever you have a VM fault, you first check if the fault address is a valid user address. As we have seen in this figure, there are uh, plenty of empty regions in the user address, address space that points to nowhere. Meaning that if you receive a VM fault, that the, the virtual address is some, somewhere here or somewhere here. You know that it cannot be that case. It's a invalid user pointer. And in that case, you should reject that um, VM fault immediately. Right? It's not, so first you need to check if the fault address is valid. Then, if it's valid, it must fall into one of the regions, either code region, data region, heap, or stack. And the next step is to check the permission, right? Only the, um, I would say only the code region has a special permission, which is read only, right? You really need to check if it falls into the code region and the user want to write. In that case, you should reject. That's the case where the, um, the user can violate the permission of that page. After you check the fault address is a valid user pointer and the operation is valid, then you check whether it's a page fault or not. And you have, I think you have answered this in the code reading questions to differentiate TLB fault versus page fault, right? When you have a VM fault, you do not necessarily have a page fault, right? It's just that it may be just that the page is already there in the memory. There is just a no bridge in the TLB to connect the virtual to physical mapping, right? If that's the case, then there is very little you need to do. You just uh, fix up the TLB entry and you are done, right? That's the most simplest case. So check whether it's a TLB fault or page fault or both, right? That's the, that's the thing you need to check. And if it's a page fault, which means that there is, you need to allocate a page. Or, necess or not necessarily, either allocate a blank, fresh, <coughs> physical page, or you need to swap in a page from the disk. We'll talk about the later case in the next presentation. And for now, let's assume that if it's a page fault, then you need to allocate a physical page, which you can use your al allocated key pages or some other page allocation function. You need to interact with the call map to reflect that that page has been already allocated, right? So once you get a hang of that physical page, 
you get the physical address. Right? You have virtual address, you have physical address. Now it's time to update the TLB entry so that this mapping is correctly reflected in the TLB. So this is the basic flow of how you handle the VM fault. And uh, each step is tricky. And you can, you, you might uh, find, you might be confused in some every steps. So it's important to get this whole picture in, in mind, keep this whole picture in mind and know what you are doing in each step, right? Um, so this is basically what I have today. Any questions on this? You, yeah. Yeah. By rejecting it, I mean kill the thread. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because at this point, you know that the user program is malbehaving, yeah. so you know it's uh, you should kill, you should kill it. And you should really get started working on this. Otherwise, you have no idea of what I'm talking about. Right? You should really get a call map done. Cam one, cam two, pass that. Move on to uh, the page table design user rest space. All right. I'll see you next time.